Let's turn back the clock to 2007, Christmas. My little brother and I got a Nintendo Wii along with an assortment of games, but one of them stood out among the rest, and that was Godzilla Unleashed. Being only five years old, I had heard of Godzilla, I had seen the Matthew Broderick movie, I liked that movie, but... You know, I really only knew him as a giant monster that destroys skyscrapers. Upon firing the game up, I immediately fell in love with the world that I had no clue even existed. Mothra, Mechagodzilla, King Ghidorah, almost immediately I begged my parents to reserve every Godzilla DVD from our local library. They only had a few Showa films, but I didn't care. I watched films like Mothra vs. Godzilla and Invasion of the Astro Monster until I was blue in the face. I was a full-on Godzilla fanatic. Fast forward to 2010 and I got word that Legendary Pictures was actively developing a Godzilla film. I would spend the next four years checking the IMDb page on a daily basis, hoping for any update on the project. I hoped that this would be the film that would get everyone at my school talking about Godzilla. As that May release date drew nearer, I was so excited for this movie. My parents got me tickets to see it a day before it came out. My dad and I saw it at midnight, and this was on a school night, mind you. I remember my palms were sweating when the lights started to dim. I wanted this film to be good. No, I needed this movie to be good. And what did I think of the movie? I loved it. In fact, I still do to this day. I, I remember losing my mind after the movie ended and constantly talking about it with my dad the whole ride home. He thought it was okay. And, you know, that seemed to be the general consensus towards the film from, you know, general audiences and whatnot. Many were disappointed by how little action there was and how Godzilla was barely in the movie. I even found that a lot of Godzilla fans just didn't like this movie all too much. It may be blind nostalgia, but I still love this movie for what it is. So I want to know, does it still hold up? Well, let's not waste any more time and jump right into it. This is Godzilla 2014. Wait, are you tired of feeling like your online privacy is as secure as a post-it note on a busy street? Picture this, browsing the internet without protection is like traveling with a see-through backpack everyone can see where you keep your wallet. But fear not, because today's video is sponsored by Private Internet Access, your virtual bodyguard in the digital world. So what exactly is a VPN? Well, it's a lot like a cloak of invisibility for your internet connection. With Private Internet Access, your IP address is hidden and your online activity is encrypted through a secure tunnel, shielding you from prying eyes and data thieves. Think about those public Wi-Fi networks at airports or coffee shops. They're a goldmine for hackers lurking in the shadows, ready to snatch your personal data quicker than you can say password 123. But with Private Internet Access, your your data stays safe and sound, even on sketchy networks. Their world-class server infrastructure encrypts your connection, making your information as bulletproof as Godzilla. And here's the kicker. Have you ever missed out on binge-watching your favorite shows because of regional restrictions? With private internet access, you can wave goodbye to geoblocks and say hello to unlimited content from around the globe. From streaming services to online deals, private internet access lets you access it all with just a click of a button. And with support for all major platforms, you can protect every device in your household or workspace. And did I forget to mention their commitment to privacy? With over 30 million downloads, Private Internet Access is the most transparent VPN provider out there. They never log your data, and their no-logs policy has stood the test of time. Plus, signing up for Private Internet Access is risk-free, with their 30-day money-back guarantee and 24-7 customer support at your fingertips. Speaking from personal experience, this is the best VPN that I've ever used. So, why wait? Protect your digital life today with private internet access. You can use my referral code www.piavpn.com slash firewood to get 83% off private internet access with four months free. You heard that right. Four months free. Remember, when it comes to your privacy, don't leave it to chance. Choose private internet access.
1954, a colossal prehistoric creature known as Godzilla inadvertently awakens as a result of an American submarine reaching the ocean floor. The United States and Russian militaries attempted to eliminate Godzilla using nuclear weapons. Despite multiple efforts, Godzilla survived, and the operation was disguised as atomic tests, concealing his existence from the public. Fast forward to 1999, Dr. Ishiro Sarazawa is summoned to a mining site in the Philippines, discovering a massive fossilized skeleton and two spores in an underground cave. One spore has already hatched, leading the team to a tunnel that extends to the surface. Near Tokyo, in Japan, a nuclear power plant experiences seismic activity, resulting in a catastrophic event in the evacuation of the Janjira area. In 2014, 15 years later, Ford, now an explosive disposal officer, learns that his father, Joe, was arrested for trespassing in Janjira. You see, in Janjira, Joe's wife was killed in the explosion. This event caused a rift in the relationship between Joe and Ford. After Ford bails Joe out, they uncover a rebuilt power plant with a mysterious chrysalis. The creature inside wreaks havoc and Joe dies during the chaos. Sarazawa reveals the existence of a secret organization called Monarch, explaining the ancient origins of Godzilla and the newly identified Muto massive, unidentified terrestrial organism. Ford then travels to Honolulu, Hawaii, with the ultimate goal of just returning to San Francisco and reuniting with his family. In a dense forest in Honolulu, a specialized U.S. Navy team stumbles upon the remnants of a Russian nuclear submarine previously under attack. During their investigation, the winged Mudo arrives, tearing apart the submarine and feeding on its reactor. Provoked by the military, the Mudo emits an EMP, shutting down electronics for miles. Meanwhile, Ford boards a train and witnesses a young boy who is separated from his parents, assuring the parents that he will return their son. Ford and the boy face an attack by the Mudo. The creature bites into the tracks and causes the train to derail. Meanwhile, Godzilla's arrival on Honolulu triggers a tsunami, leading to massive destruction at the international airport. Godzilla fights the Mudo and their clash is captured on the news which is witnessed by Ford's wife and son. Sarazawa reports that Godzilla is responding to an echolocation signal, actively hunting down the Mudo. They realize that the Mudo sent a signal and discover that the other spore is still active, having hatched into a larger rampaging creature in Las Vegas. Monarch determines that the larger Mudo is female and the winged one is male, planning to nest in San Francisco. The military proposes the idea of using a nuclear warhead to attract all the monsters and then detonate it. But Serizawa opposes. He advocates for Godzilla as the potential savior. Ford, now on the mainland, joins a military train to evacuate Ellie and Sam from San Francisco. That's his wife and kid. The train, equipped with ICBMs to combat the monsters, is all of a sudden destroyed by the female eight-legged Mudo. Ford is the sole survivor, and one warhead is devoured while the other is flown to San Francisco. The male Mudo steals the armed warhead. Citizens are evacuated and Godzilla faces opposition from the Navy near the Golden Gate Bridge. Recognizing Godzilla as their potential savior, the military allows him to confront the Mudos. The Mudos meet in Chinatown, building a nest after mating. Godzilla intervenes, causing conflict with the male Mudo, and Ford is tasked with a halo drop to retrieve the warhead and turn it off. In one of the greatest scenes in any Godzilla movie, Ford and the team halo drop into San Francisco. They locate the nest just as Godzilla engages with the female Mudo. Ford manages to destroy the nest of eggs, attracting the Mudos away from Godzilla. The female Mudo attempts to kill Ford, but Godzilla intervenes, saving him. Godzilla defeats the male Mudo, but a building collapse temporarily traps him. Ford's team plans to sail the armed warhead into the ocean, away from the population. The female Mudo then attacks. It kills the entire crew except for Ford. Attempting to drive the boat out to the ocean, Ford faces the female's EMP field. All of a sudden, Godzilla reappears and saves Ford once again. After a fierce struggle, Godzilla defeats the female Mudo by holding its jaw open and then breathing its atomic breath through its mouth. It is incredible. The next morning, Ford is reunited with his family while Serizawa believes that Godzilla is dead. However, Godzilla reawakens and stands before the human survivors. With balance restored, he roars and then triumphantly disappears into the ocean, leaving humans behind to watch in awe.
The making of Godzilla 2014 actually dates all the way back to August 2004. Yoshimitsu Bano, who is known for directing 1971's Godzilla vs. Hedorah, announced plans for a Godzilla IMAX short film that would be in 3D. He secured the rights from Toho, and this project would be titled Godzilla 3D to the Max. It aimed to serve as a remake of Godzilla vs. Hedorah, but kind of loosely. In 2005, Peter Anderson joined as cinematographer, visual effects supervisor, and co-producer. However, financial troubles in 2008 endangered the project. In 2009, they sought backing from Legendary Pictures, and then rumors emerged of Legendary negotiating with Toho to just make an entirely new American Godzilla film. Officially announced on March 29th, 2010, Legendary acquired the Godzilla license, planning a film close to Toho's version and very very distinct from the 1998 film. Legendary aimed to honor the essential Godzilla elements. Legendary greenlit the project with Bono and the other people involved with Godzilla 3D to the max as executive producers. Gareth Edwards was announced as director in January 2011. He had previously directed Monsters. It's this low-budget film set four years after a giant alien invasion in which two characters must travel from the infected zone in Mexico to the safety of the U.S. border while dealing with the threat of giant kaiju-sized alien squid monsters. It's a really cool movie, by the way. I recommend checking it out. You can kind of see little seeds of Godzilla 2014 in this, and also his future work on films like Rogue One and The Creator. It was because of his efficient and effective work on Monsters that he was brought on to direct the 2014 American remake of Godzilla. Edwards showed that he had a clear understanding of showcasing the scale of monsters, making them appear larger than life, especially when compared to humans. Edwards also emphasized that this film would be a clear departure from the 98 film, focusing on fan expectations and the significance of getting it right. The film entered development in 2012, but faced some delays. Principal photography began in 2013 in March in Vancouver and concluded in Hawaii in July of that year. Post-production would last up until March 2014, and the movie would be released in theaters on May 14th, 2014. The design of the 2014 American Godzilla is one that I just adore. Apparently, Toho required that this iteration of the King of the Monsters had the trademark spikes and four fingers on each hand, likely to avoid the drastically different design that they got with Patrick Totopoulos for the 98 film. Gareth Edwards wanted his version of Godzilla to feel like what a Toho employee would have seen in real life in the 50s and then described to people making the rubber suits to replicate. He wanted it to feel like a real tangible creature. Godzilla's movement and appearance throughout the film was based on Komodo dragons, wolves, lions, and bears. Even after watching this film, I still wholeheartedly believe that this is a quality kaiju flick. Ten years later, it holds up really, really well. For starters, Gareth Edwards really understands scale. The camera is never flying around in an unrealistic manner. Instead, every shot is filmed in a place where a camera could realistically be, whether that's from the inside of an office building or from ground level. It keeps everything consistent and doesn't feel like you're just watching a video game cutscene. Beyond that, the CGI really holds up compared to a lot of the stuff that's out there nowadays. And sure, the picture quality is way too dark, and I'm hoping that this gets fixed soon, but still, a lot of the potential flaws are expertly hidden because we barely see the monsters during the daytime, and if we do, it's just a small glimpse here and there. I remember when this movie first came out, and a lot of people complained about that aspect of the movie. Audiences had a problem with the film being called Godzilla, but hardly featuring any Godzilla with him only having like 10 minutes of screen time. On top of that, most of the monster scenes are at night, or we hardly see them because the film cuts away from the action right when it's about to get interesting. The explanation that Gareth Edwards gave was that he wanted Godzilla 2014 to take more of a subdued approach, reminiscent of classic 70s films like Alien, Jaws, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Explaining his choice for a restrained direction, Edwards Edwards expressed a desire to avoid the constant bombardment seen in modern cinema. He aimed for Godzilla to possess a universal appeal, akin to Close Encounters of the Third Kind, focusing on genuine, relatable characters reminiscent of Steven Spielberg's work. While I do think that the characters fall flat here, and trust me, we will get to that, I think this is a respectable approach to making this movie. It's kind of a slow burn, and that slow pacing really pays off in the final act when we get a really solid Godzilla vs. Mudo battle. 
title. Godzilla 2014 is not a balls-to-the-wall action flick, and it doesn't need to be. If you want a kaiju movie like that, then go watch Pacific Rim or even Godzilla Final Wars, which is probably the most extreme balls-to-the-wall Godzilla movie ever made. I'm not ripping on those two movies, I love those two movies, but this just isn't that type of movie. Now, I understand where Edwards is coming from and why he took this approach, or rather, why he believes he took this approach. But I have an entirely different possible reason as to why we barely get a ton of kaiju action. You see, Edwards comes from the world of indie filmmaking, specifically no-budget filmmaking. His directorial debut, Monsters, only had a budget of $500,000, which sounds like a lot, but considering what type of movie it is, it really isn't. As a no-budget filmmaker myself, I am very much familiar with trying to make something from nothing. You have to learn and acquire certain habits and tendencies in order to ensure that a film actually sees the light of day. So when Edwards was given a $160 million budget, I think he took a lot of those no-budget tendencies with him. It likely wasn't intentional. As a result, Edwards cut away from the action scenes as a means of maintaining suspense and stretching that production budget. In the world of indie filmmaking where every dollar counts, filmmakers often resort to creative methods to just imply the action rather than show it. Most of the time it's because of budget or just a deliberate choice, but I think in Monsters, Edwards mastered the art of suggestion, using minimalistic approaches to imply the presence of otherworldly creatures while focusing on the human drama amidst the chaos. This methodology is evident in Godzilla 2014, where the emphasis is not solely on the epic clashes between the monsters, but on the human experience amidst the catastrophic events. By limiting the audience's direct exposure to Godzilla and the Mudos, Edwards invokes a sense of anticipation and mystery reminiscent of classic suspense films. It's a calculated risk, aiming to build tension and invest the audience emotionally in the character's plight. Moreover, Edwards' background in VFX, honed during his time in the independent film circuit and also just working commercial video, informs his decision to prioritize the quality of CGI over the quantity of monster screen time. Rather than just spamming constant action sequences at the viewer, he opts for strategic placement, ensuring that each appearance of the kaiju leaves a lasting impact. Every time they show up, it's important and it adds to the story. Now, as a former theater kid, I, I have to say, really quick tangent about musicals. I know this seems really weird because it's about Godzilla, but just trust me, this will make sense. In a musical, a song should serve a purpose. If you can cut the song out and the story still advances, then the song should not be in that musical. I think monster movies and even action movies as a whole are the same way. If you can completely remove an action scene or a monster battle and the plot still progresses forward, then it shouldn't be included. I understand a lot of people would disagree with that because people just like seeing giant monsters and I get it, but the point of filmmaking in the first place is to tell a story. Unfortunately, the story that audiences expected was nonstop monster mayhem. And this subdued pacing and restrained spectacle of Godzilla 2014, it's why so many people felt underwhelmed by this movie. But for those that are attuned to Edward's vision, it represents a departure from the typical Hollywood blockbuster formula. It's a deliberate attempt to infuse depth and substance into the kaiju genre. Of course, that depth and substance has been in the kaiju genre since the first Godzilla film, but it's a breath of fresh air, especially in 2014, when we barely had any kaiju content. That being said, though, that so-called depth or substance isn't actually deep or substantive. Godzilla 2014 falls flat on its face when trying to establish characters that the audience should care about. As a result, the emotional core of the film feels hollow, leaving viewers disconnected from the human drama unfolding amidst the kaiju chaos. Edward's attempt to channel the spirit of classic Spielbergian storytelling, while commendable, ultimately misses the mark in terms of character development. Despite his aspirations to craft relatable protagonists akin to those in Jaws, or Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the characters in Godzilla 2014 just lack depth and dimension. Take Ford Brody, played by Aaron Taylor Johnson, for example. As the central figure thrust into the heart of the kaiju crisis, Ford comes across as more of a generic action hero than a fully realized character. His motivations and inner struggles remain superficial, driven more by plot convenience than genuine emotional resonance. 
Likewise, other key players like Ellie Brody, played by Elizabeth Olsen, and Dr. Ishiro Serizawa, played by Ken Watanabe, are given very little opportunity to really do anything besides just say a cool line or just be concerned. Sure, Serizawa has his legendary let them fight line. He has that interesting scene where he talks about his pocket watch, but I can't think of anything else his character did in the film that was memorable. He functions more or less as a means of just moving the plot forward and delivering exposition rather than just being a likable character. He has all the makings of being a great character too. His backstory with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is very compelling, but it's never properly explored in a meaningful way. On top of that, the dialogue just feels very stilted and expository, with characters delivering lines that sound more like placeholders for exposition rather than authentic expressions of thought and emotion. It robs the film of having a nuanced interplay and genuine moments that define Spielberg's most iconic works. The supporting cast, mainly Joe Brody, is extremely underutilized. He's relegated to just serving a narrative device than being a fully fleshed out individual with his own arc and aspiration. Again, he could be a more interesting character, but is ultimately held back by the film being forced to center around Aaron Taylor Johnson's boring main character. And I know I'm not the only person who's said this or made this point before, but it would have been so much better if the protagonist was Brian Cranston's character. By now, I'm sure that you are aware that despite being showcased in the trailers, Cranston's character dies early on in the film. It's a bit of a twist, especially if you saw this in theaters, but it's not a good twist. Hindsight is 2020, and I'm not going to fawn over what could have been, but it just kind of stings thinking about a movie with Brian Cranston fresh off of Breaking Bad being a lead in a Godzilla movie. I remember reading in my copy of Famous Monsters of Filmland that Gareth Edwards was a huge fan of tokusatsu movies and had immense respect towards the genre. This got me hyped, knowing that a true fan of the genre was helming this version of Godzilla. Was it a mistake to kill off Brian Cranston's character so early on? Absolutely, even he admitted that. Was it a mistake to not show the monsters fighting as much as they could have? Maybe. The film definitely has a different pace than most modern blockbusters. Gareth Edwards stated in interviews that he wanted to make the movie with the idea of it being a 70s blockbuster rather than a modern day blockbuster, and this is clearly evident in the slow burn pacing. If anything, it's very much in line with the rest of the Godzilla franchise, especially the Showa era films. The amount of screen time that Godzilla has in this film is actually more than the majority of the Showa era films. In fact, he's shown on screen more in this than the original Godzilla 1954 film. I feel like the lack of his screen time is more of a complaint from those who don't simply understand the franchise. I certainly respect Gareth Edwards for making a film that feels slightly out of time. Especially when we get more and more into the movies like Godzilla vs. Kong, because holy crap, it's night and day. I want to thank you all so much for watching. This is part two of my big retrospective series on Godzilla. I'm starting with all the American Godzilla films. And in October, I'll be covering all the Japanese ones. Stay tuned because next week I will have my retrospectives out for Godzilla King of the Monsters and Godzilla vs. Kong. I'll also be doing a thoughts on video for Godzilla X Kong, the new empire. Once that comes out, my thoughts on videos are a bit more, you know, loose. I'm not exactly going super in depth like this. It's more or less just a quick eight to 10 minute long review. And uh, that's basically it. I'll make a bigger retrospective later on once I've had more time with the movie. It feels wrong to make a retrospective for a movie that just dropped. So yeah, wait on that. But otherwise, uh, King of the Monsters, that one should be out Wednesday. And the Godzilla vs. Kong one should be out Friday. Unless you're watching this in the future, then it's already out. Go watch it. Wrapping everything up, though, I just want to say I'm Cole McCormick. You're watching Firewood Media. Thank you so much for watching this. I really appreciate it. Uh, this new jump in viewership has been crazy, and I'm just so, so thankful. So uh, with all that out of the way, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.